in the office that you're going for, come see me and write a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. All right, give Mr. Gates a hand. He didn't tell me how all these other books up here was about one cookbook, but you know, what happens? Well, uh, here, hang on a second. Our Australian guest, Nick Adams, just appeared. And uh, then come on up. Let's look up Nick Adams with a hand.
Freedom is not something that we can simply just accept and expect to last without making great effort, great insistent effort to ensure that it remains alive. And right now, I know that America is dispirited to some degree. I know that your famous optimism is on the way. And perhaps as I speak here to you this morning, this is America's most challenging time yet. America may well be falling behind, ladies and gentlemen, but America is not falling behind any other country. It's falling behind its own potential. Lots of people say to me, they say, Mr. Adams, why does it matter to an outsider? Why does it matter to a foreigner, a non-American? What happens to America or what happens in America? The answer, my friends, is very simple. What is good for America is good for the world. A strong America is a strong world. A weak America is a weak world. And that's why it is just so critical that we keep this nation strong. Because that shining light that you have been to people everywhere, that can only happen if the lamp is shining at home first. And so it's incumbent on all of you, and it's incumbent, I believe, on Friends of America, one of which I consider myself to be, to come here and to urge you to exercise fidelity to the founding principles, to those flames of the American fireplace, freedom, liberty, justice, democracy, bravery. Now is the time to remember who you are and where you come from, what you've achieved and what you can still achieve. Sometimes it takes someone on the outside to remind you or or tell you what you're like on the inside. And I hope I can offer somewhat of a unique perspective here to you this morning. I know this is pretty hard-hitting stuff for uh, 7.30 in the morning, but it's very important, uh, my friends, it's very important that you remain strong and that you remember what makes this nation great. What makes this nation great is its religious and moral character. Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French philosopher who visited here in the 18th century, said America is great because America is good. America will cease to be great if she ceases to be good. And that's something that you need, those are words that you need to carry with you every day in your pockets, in your minds and in your hearts. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to take questions. If that's the protocol, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just curious, from not being a citizen of the United States, but of Australia, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom? When you say, uh, uh, talk about America and freedom, what what are, what are you saying? No one does freedom like the United States of America. The Western world, technically, has freedom. But when you go even to the English-speaking nations, England, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the same freedom that the men and women of America enjoy are simply not present. Technically, we have freedom of speech, and you may well be free to say what you want to say, but you're certainly not free of the consequences that are associated with that. In those societies, in those collectivist societies, what happens is you speak your mind and suddenly you're ostracised. Suddenly, you can't get access to clubs or audiences or things like that. You're blackballed or blacklisted. That's the way that things operate, even in these democratic, technically free countries. Freedom to me means individual liberty. I believe people are free to pursue their dream. And what I love about America, the thing I love most about America, is that you subscribe to this marvellous idea that anyone, can rise above the circumstances of their birth and achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve. And I believe fundamentally freedom is just about that. It's allowing an individual to pursue that American dream, as is written and offered in your famous 
Declaration of Independence. The right to pursue happiness. Any more questions? That's it at all. That's it at all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, that's, that's one of the most impressive speeches I've ever heard here at the Case of Mafia. It's our first international guest. So, individual freedom and liberty. I mean, did anyone get chill bumps beside me listening to that, that presentation? I don't think he needs to go speak at the Citadel. I think he needs to go speak at the White House. At the White House. That's true. Yeah. I, I, I'm afraid that maybe. Well, let's. For those of you who are, who are speaking while the, while the speaker is speaking, I want to say this. You need to listen to this, Mr. Burke. You know, he was talking about the freedoms that this country is based upon, individual freedom and liberty, uh, about this concept of libertarianism, about pursuing your dreams. And this is something all of us who are running for office should be espousing. It's time to listen. It's time to speak, to have words and actions match. It's not time to, to shrink and hide from your responsibility. It's time to listen to these words and take action on these words. It's time to stand up and take action. It's not time to go and hide. It's time to take action. Stand at your state house like Wes Howard and all these other people are doing, and Doc Kara's doing. Run for office, try to make a difference. It's time to do that. We've had a record number of people file for office in Lexington County, and it's great. Nothing against any incumbent. <coughs> Everyone should have the opportunity. Everyone can work hard, take risk in their lives, rise to the level of their potential, and be rewarded, not blackball in other countries like he's talking about. Nick is absolutely right. Let's make this country the freest country in the world. Nick, thanks. Let's give him another round of applause. Okay. <laughs> Karen, Karen Coleman, matters, next speaker, running for Senate District 18. Karen. Thanks. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here this morning. Um, I'm trying to caffeinate up because you do get up early, but I appreciate the chance to talk to you and, and meet people face to face. Um, I am not a politician. We've established that. I had a career in television, and I thought and prayed long and hard before making a decision to get into this field of politics. The only people hated more than reporters are politicians. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to that scrutiny. Um, and before in coming to my decision to run for office, I attended some meetings to start to hear what people are saying. One of them uh, most recently in Lexington District 1, talking about the state of education in South Carolina and listening to the teachers and the educators uh, talk about what they consider the issues. And as I sat there, my kids, I have a six, a four, and a two-year-old, you know, we're getting close to school age got depressed. Lexington One is supposed to be one of the leading uh, places to get an education in our state, or at least the Midlands. And those folks, the teachers, um, are down and out. They have over 30 students in certain classrooms. Um, their salaries, in often cases, are very low. And they see a system that they say are, is top-heavy with uh, superintendents, the Department of Education, a lot of these folks making excess of $100,000, it's hard for them to get motivated when they're right there in the trenches and they see uh, these folks that are in more management positions making a lot of money. It's very hard to get motivated to go into that classroom when the cost to educate a student is less now than it was in the early 2000s. And after that meeting, uh, Representative Kenny Bingham was there and he was speaking to me and uh, said, you know, Kara, if you do decide to run, if you do decide to go and uh, seek this office, you're going to love the campaign trail because you can get out and you can meet people and you can see folks from all different walks of life, the people that you might have a chance to represent. And when he said that, it almost helped me make my decision to run because in television, that's what we did for my entire career. I got out into the state, I met people, I listened to problems, and as I mentioned in our little pre-interview, those problems often ended at the state house, and uh, those problems turned into be certain bills. And when I say that, I mean behind the bills at the state house, oftentimes are faces of people who need change, faces who uh, need the economy to change in order for basic survival. So I feel like, uh, well, you know, I don't have the political background that a lot of folks that I'm running against do have. I think that's a good thing in this day and age, that we don't need career politicians who have 
develop these relationships over the years where they feel that they owe folks things and they get in the state house and there comes our problem of saying one thing and doing the other. They have all of these pressures behind the scenes that are tugging them one way or another. I know the people and the players of the state house, but I don't have those ties. And I feel like I do have a strong voice from being up there where I can stand up for the people of District 18 and do what is right. And that is my major motivation to make life better for my six, my four, and my two-year-old as they reach for the American dream that I feel like may pass us by if we don't start changing things and don't change things quickly. Um, I appreciate anyone who has given time and service to our state and to our country. And I'm not here to talk ill about anyone. But I do believe that accountability uh, is very important, and we need to hold our current leaders accountable for how they voted. I wouldn't be here if I did not feel that I would offer a better option for voters than what we currently have in office. Uh, in my opinion, has cast some ballots in some very non-Republican kind of ways. Um, obviously, if you check his voting record, he is a lot more fiscally liberal than we are as Republicans. Um, but outside of that, one of the big problems we have here in South Carolina is transparency. We've talked about it for years. We know things need to change. Uh, if we are more transparent, we will see that there are many ways that we can save money in this state. And Senator Cromer recently voted on a bill that was brought forth by Senator Tom Davis that would shed the light of transparency on economic incentives given to businesses who want to come into our state. He voted against that bill. And I just don't understand why anyone would vote against shedding more light on serious issues, especially when it comes to uh, people from out of state often coming in and getting tax breaks that our companies and our businesses in state fail to have. They don't have the same type of opportunities as a lot of these folks coming in to do business, even though South Carolina businesses represent 97% of the folks who do business in our state. Transparency is a huge issue. Um, also, you know, I think when it comes to education, we talk about universal school choice. I believe in it. I believe in competition uh, in all aspects of our life. But I do believe that this would make our schools better. Also, I think that it would help with accountability in the long run. But I also think that we need to start looking at ways where we can save money right now and start adding up all of those dollars in order to start rolling back some of our taxes here in South Carolina. When you start breaking down uh, every aspect of our government, you can start to see where you can uh, save hundreds of thousands of dollars here, a uh, million dollars there. And well, when you look at them in segments, it doesn't seem like it's enough to make any huge dent in all of our...